Well, can I uh, invite you to uh, turn back to Genesis? Uh, we read earlier Genesis chapter 12. Uh, we're going to be looking at now Genesis 13. Uh, Genesis 13, if you can open your Bibles there uh, to follow along. This is what we're going to be looking at this morning. Uh, we're pausing our series in Luke uh, just for this holiday break. So I thought it would be good to uh, jump back into the Old Testament. Uh, remember, Jesus and the apostles only had the Old Testament. They preached the gospel from the Old Testament. Um, so uh, it is worthy of our attention and it is God's word. So Genesis 13, and we can read the chapter uh, together. Verse 1, so Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, and Lot went with him into the Negev. Now Abraham uh, was very rich in livestock, in silver, in gold, and he journeyed on from the Negev as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai, to the place where he had made an altar at the first and there Abram called upon the name of the Lord. And Lot, who went with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents, so that the land could not support both of them dwelling together, for their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. At that time the Canaanites and the Perizzites were dwelling in the land. Then Abram said to Lot, Let there be no strife between you and me, and between your herdsmen and my herdsmen, for we are kinsmen. Is not the whole land before you? Separate yourself from me. If you take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if you take the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and saw that the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt in the direction of Zor. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself all the Jordan Valley, and Lot journeyed east. Thus they separated from each other. Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled among the cities of the valley and moved his tent as far as Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward, for all the land that you see I will give to you and to your offspring forever. I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth, so that if one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring also can be counted. Arise, walk through the length and the breadth of the land, for I will give it to you. So Abram moved his tent and came and settled by the oaks of Mamre, which are at Hebron. And there he built an altar to the Lord. At the, uh, at the beginning of the service, uh, it's interesting, Jeff had read 2 Corinthians 5 verse 7. And it says, For we walk by faith, and not by sight. Now, this has become one of the most common, well-known biblical expressions, right? Sums up following God, life in the kingdom. Now, we know that we are saved by faith. A person puts their trust and their belief in Jesus Christ, and by that faith, God credits to them the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We are saved by putting faith in, in the works of another. We're not saved by works, but by Jesus' works. On the cross, his life, his death, and his resurrection. So we know we're saved by faith. But then we get this expression that we live by faith. We walk by faith and not by sight. Now, walk here is the life of faith. Faith lived out, not what saves a person, but this is their lifestyle. So, I guess the question we want to look at this morning, this well-known biblical expression, to walk by faith and not by sight, what does that mean practically? What does it look like? We all know the saying, 
But do we know what it means? Are we walking by faith? Or could it be said of us that we are walking by sight? Uh, this is what I want us to see this morning. And our passage this morning contains such a wealth of truth. In God's wisdom, he gives us a text where we can see walking by faith and walking by sight in the one event so that there can be no confusion. So as we explore this uh, foundational truth this morning, uh, would you bow one more time as we ask for God's grace to give us the understanding? Our Father, we have Bibles in our laps and we thank you for this great privilege. Lord, many bled and died to have the scriptures translated into English for us and we thank you for that. But Lord, we even recognize on this very day that false teachers have the Bibles on their laps and on the podium, on the pulpit, and a teaching from the Word. And so, God, we recognize that we need to be taught by the Holy Spirit. And so we pray for your leading, we pray for instruction, we pray for truth, and that you guide us away from error. And we pray that you would give us understanding, Lord, not so that we might become puffed up, so that we would rather live pleasing to you. We just want to please our Master. And so, Lord... Speak now, for your servants are listening. And may your word come with divine power as the living word in the hands of the living Holy Spirit. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we had uh, Genesis 12 read earlier because it is just helpful context. And can I just say this? If I say throughout the sermon, Abraham... Uh, can you be gracious to me? Is, is Abram's on the brink of being called Abraham? And I'm so used to calling him Abraham. I'll probably do that. Um, but chapter 12 gives us the context. And, and right at the start, verse 1, uh, Abram is introduced and God just suddenly sets his love upon this man. Abram was a pagan idolater. He was raised in a family, in a home that worshipped idols, lived in a pagan land. And Abram wasn't looking for God. This is grace. This is how salvation works. People don't go looking for God. God goes looking for them. And he calls sinners to himself. And the Lord makes Abram a pilgrim. And really he becomes a prototype for all who would be those of faith. Uh, I think Peter picks up on this language in 1 Peter 2.11. He says, Beloved, as pilgrims and strangers, I urge you to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against your soul. We are pilgrims exactly like Abram. And so God calls Abram to leave his land, that pagan land, behind. And he's called at the age of 75, right? It's not too late uh, for salvation. 75. In verse 7 of chapter 12, God shows his relationship now with Abram, and Abram responds in the second half of verse 7, he built an altar to the Lord. Now this will see, as you, as you go through Genesis, this becomes a pattern of Abraham, uh, building an altar. Verse 8, he moves onwards, and in the next verse, when he reaches his next destination, what does he do? He builds an altar and calls on the Lord there. Again, this is his pattern of worship. Now the idols are gone. Verse 10 of chapter 12, famine strikes the land, and so he has, he has to head to Egypt. So God has sent him to Canaan, but the land is desolate now and struggling. And so he heads south further. And already this trek and this pilgrimage that God has called him on, it's not easy. Immediately he moves from the comfort of his land into famine, and he's learning contentment already. We get to chapter 13 now, that by way of context. If you're taking notes, our first point this morning, walking by faith involves ongoing repentance. Walking by faith involves ongoing repentance. Look at verses 1 to 2. So Abram went from Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and lot with him into the Negev. Now Abram was very rich in livestock, in silver, and in gold. You see there right at the beginning of verse 1, he moved on from Egypt. That is very gentle language from the uh, author. He was kicked out of Egypt. Pharaoh, Pharaoh got rid of him, right? And so he's on the move again. And 
you cannot help but notice the Holy Spirit through the author of Moses makes specific mention of Abram's wealth. Now this is going to keep coming up. We're going to see in the text his wealth. It becomes a key theme throughout the passage. It says, now Abram was very rich, livestock, silver, and in gold. Now he became very wealthy. He was already wealthy in Haran, but now he has great wealth that has uh, recently come to him. And you look at the wealth that fell on his lap in Egypt. It says in chapter 12, verse 16, and for Sarai's sake, Pharaoh dealt well with Abram. Now, how did he do well? He had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male servants, female servants, female donkeys, and camels. So really, uh, Pharaoh loads this guy up. Thank you for bringing your beautiful sister to our country. Uh, and really, his time in Egypt seems worth it, right? Look how much he gains. From the world's perspective, this has been wonderful for Abram to be here. But Abram realized that it, it hasn't been wonderful that he has been there and what has happened. Look at verses 3 to 4. And he journeyed on from the Negev as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai, to the place where he had made an altar at the first. And there Abram called upon the name of the Lord. So he comes all the way from north to the land of Canaan. Then he goes into Egypt because of famine. Now he goes back up into Canaan, which would be Israel today. And then he goes past Jerusalem all the way back to Bethel. Out of all the places, he goes back to where he was before. Why would you go back there? Why does he do this? Well, the author gives us not so subtle hints here, right? What does it say? Verse 3, he went to the place where his tent had been at the beginning. Verse 4, the place where he had made an altar at the first. Do you see the emphasis of the language? He went back to the place at the beginning. And he went to the place where he pitched his tent at first. Beginning, first. What's he saying? He's gone way back to where he was. And what does he do there? It says, and he called on the name of the Lord. What's going on there? In Egypt, Abram sinned against the Lord. The man of faith sinned against the Lord. He's in trouble. He realizes he has a beautiful wife and he's scared for his life that they're going to take his wife and kill him. So what does he do? He lies. My dear wife, tell them that you're my sister so that I might be spared. And he's having this shaking already, this crisis of faith already. And what a terrible witness in Egypt, right? The man of God. And he gets rebuked by an unbeliever. Understand this. It's, it's, it's hard and it stings when a Christian rebukes you. But it stings so much when an unbeliever rebukes you as a Christian for how you should be living. And he's rebuked by Pharaoh. And what does he do after all of this? He goes back to Bethel. He goes back to the place where he met with the Lord, where he built an altar, where he worshipped. He, go, he goes back to the place where he called on God to be his God. He goes right back to the place where he committed himself to Yahweh. And that's why the author says he went back to the place at the beginning, at the first it's as if Abram is starting again. I'm, I'm starting again. I'm renewing my faith and trust in God. Let me quote one writer. He, he says this beautifully. Quote, it is important to notice that he came back and that the way was open for him to come back and that the Lord received him back as the continuing story proves. End quote. With God, the way is always open to come back. It's always open. Let me ask you, did you start the race well? Did you make great public declarations of your faith in Jesus Christ? And have you gone astray? Have you wandered? Have you traded simple faith in God for walking according to the wisdom of man? Can you relate to Abraham here? Is your faith cooling off? Have you been led off course and your trust diminished? Come back to the place. Come back to where you were. We don't come back to Bethel when we stray. Where do we come back? Our Bethel is Calvary. That's the place where we saw the light. 
That's the place where we gained faith. That's the place where we were delivered and the Lord became our God. That's where we go back. Abraham's faith is evidenced by his repentance. What does he trust? He trusts, if I come back, I will be received back. I will. That's my God. And so he goes to the place where he began. I was reading and I came across um, just this week about a perhaps a mini revival over a century ago that took place in East Anglia in England. It's not very well known. And one of the key instruments that God uh, used in his hand was the preacher Douglas Brown. And Douglas Brown ended up saying this about, about revival. This is how Douglas Brown, who witnessed it, this is how he describes a revival. Quote, revival is not going down the street with a big drum. It's going back to Calvary with a big sob. You see, that's, that's it, right? People coming to Calvary, recognizing that they've sinned. And revival even involves the church when she comes back. And so firstly, this morning, we see walking by faith involves ongoing repentance. We see that here. Secondly, this morning, walking by faith involves otherworldly contentment. It involves otherworldly contentment. Now, it's important to note here, the authors brought up Abram's wealth, but the wealth doesn't corrupt him. It doesn't. He increased in wealth, but what does he do? He repents immediately of distrust. He renews his faith in repentance. So all of this wealth that has fallen into his lap, it doesn't grab his heart. However, what does it say? It does lead to trouble and strife. It does. Look at verse 5. And Lot who went with Abram also had flocks and herds and tents. Now, just pause there for a second. Abram wasn't the only one that left Egypt filthy rich. His nephew did. And notice everything, all the possessions Lot has, what does it say? They're all in the plural. Do you see that in the text? His flocks, herds, tents, herds, men, shepherds. He has heaps. He became very wealthy. And friends, wealth often has a, a way of bringing difficulty. You know the, the famous saying, right? More money. More problems, right? More possessions, more worries. Look at verse 6 to 7. Look what happens. And because he had increased so much, so that the land could not support both of them dwelling together, for their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. So what's going on here? They increase so much when they get back into the land of Canaan. There's not enough resources to support all of them and all that they have. There's not enough water. There's not enough pasture for all of their herds and all of their flocks and livestock. There's not enough. And what's the result? This starts fighting between Lot's herdsmen and Abram's herdsmen. They're fighting for the pastures, for water, for grass. Why couldn't the land support them? Well, look at verse 7. At that time, the Canaanites and the Perizzites were dwelling in the land. How's that? The promised land that Abram has uh, been allocated, the best portions are taken up by pagans. The land's full. And the little bit that Abram gets to enjoy, there's not enough resources. And so what happens? The fighting begins. Now, isn't it interesting? Prior to Egypt, prior to Egypt, Abram and Lot could live and travel together couldn't they? Prior to Egypt, their possessions and all, of their, all that they had, they could coincide together. They could live in harmony. There was no issue. They traveled high and low together. They traveled miles together. And all of a sudden, now it would be possessions that got in between them. And the Holy Spirit makes clear here, there wasn't trouble in the family before. But there's trouble now as a result of this increase in wealth. But let me put another footnote here. Money and wealth is not sinful. It's not. It's absolutely not sinful. What's sinful? The pursuit of money. 
The pursuit of possession, the absorption of it, the longings and cravings, the coveting so as to acquire them. That is sinful. What does 1 Timothy 6 tell us? Verse 9, but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. See, it's the love of it. It's the pursuit of it. It is the coveting of it. Now here, the promise that God gave to Abram in chapter 12, that all the, all the land of Canaan would be his, it seems like an unreliable promise, doesn't it? I mean, he gets there and there's famine in this land. Wow, thank you for the country that you've given to me. I can't even live here. He leaves, he comes back when the famine is over, and what does he find? The majority of it is occupied already by people who don't even believe in you. There's not even enough for my family. And thirdly, the land is so scarce that it's bringing strife and tension in the family. His faith is tested. His faith is under pressure here. But Abram has renewed his faith, hasn't he? We've seen that. He's renewed it. He's come back. The promise isn't fulfilled. Trouble is abounding in the family. But he's renewed his faith. So what does Abram do now? He takes the initiative. He looks at trial and he takes the initiative. Look at verse 8. Then Abram said to Lot, Let there be no strife between you and me and between your herdsmen and my herdsmen, for we are kinsmen. Let there be no strife. What's his, what's his plea here? Let not material possessions come between us. Let us not be torn apart by material possessions. May this never happen. Friends, isn't this the all too common experience in our lives, right? How many families have been blown apart because of money? How many siblings have gone to war with each other over inheritances and wills? How many marriages have been crippled by money, debts, spending, covetousness? Abraham, he looks and he says, may possessions and wealth and money never come between us. Never. Do you see the end of verse 8? What does he say? For we are kinsmen. There's two things here. We are flesh and blood. But the word also means brothers. We both believe in the same God. Twice over, we are family. Twice over. It says that Abraham was a man of faith. Go to 2 Peter 2. And Lot was a man of faith. Both of them belonged to the Lord. Both were followers of Yahweh. And so he says, how can quarreling and strife come between us? You know, this will be now an ongoing sin that dominates Abram's family. Think about Sarah and Hagar and the strife that goes between them because one of them can fall pregnant and the other one can't. What about their grandson, Jacob and Esau? One of them steals the birthright and there's strife and they have to split apart. Even Abram's offspring, the people of Israel, there are people who had strife with God. They were. Do you remember in Numbers 20 when they demanded of God, we want water. Give us drink. We're thirsty. God says to Moses, get water from the rock. And it's this extraordinary miracle. And the waters flow out of the rock. But what does it say? The place was called Meribah. The waters of Meribah. What does that mean in English? The waters of quarreling and strife. This would be ongoing. And friends, this is too common in the church. And not just in our day. Even in, even in the apostles' time, he writes to the Corinthians, there's strife and fighting and division between the rich and the poor and different classes. And then he writes to other congregations. We see it over and over in the New Testament. James 4, what causes quarrels and fights among you? Isn't it the desires in your heart, the reason why you wage war against each other? You covet and you do not have, so you steal and you kill. Quarreling in the church. And this breaks out between Lot's servants and Abram's servants, but Abram would have none of it. Why? 
Because he renewed his faith. And so he takes the initiative. And what does he do? He surrenders his rights. And he displays otherworldly contentment. Look at verse 9. He says to him, Is not the whole land before you? Separate yourself from me. If you take the left hand, then I'll go to the right. Or if you take the right hand, then I'll go to the left. See, the region east of Bethel couldn't support them. They needed to part ways. So who gets what part? Who gets where? Who gets what land? Who gets what region? When you read further on in the text, one of the regions was like paradise. And the other one was empty hills. Nothing exciting. Who gets what? What does Abram do? He gives his nephew first choice. First dibs. First crack, we would, we would say, right? First choice. The whole land is before you. If you go right, I'm going left. If you go left, I'm going right. And this should surprise us that he does this. Why? Because Abram is Lot senior. He is his elder. This is a matter of honor and shame in that culture. He's the head of the clan. And Lot is only traveling with Abram because Abram has let him. And, and Lot has only become wealthy and rich because he's been traveling with Abram. All the blessings that he has, has flowed through Abram already. And yet, what do we see? Abram gives up first choice. Let me see if I can illustrate this for you. Say so you and an only cousin, you receive a will from your grandmother and there are two properties for you. One of them is a beachfront in a wealthy area and the other one is a run-down shack in a poor, troubled, unsafe area. And the will say, the will's incomplete, so you two have to sort it out. Who gets what? Who gets what? And you take the initiative and say, you choose first. Whatever you want, I'm happy to have. I'm happy to have the other. This, this is what Abram does here. And it's incredible. It's amazing. And it's astonishing that he would do this. But it's also troubling, isn't it? Do we display contentment like that? Do we display a life of faith like this? Through utter contentment? See, he's not after the nicest things. He, he's not after the most. He's not after the best. He willingly forfeits the best. And he hands it over. This is beautiful contentment. How can he do this? Because he was just at Bethel and he enjoyed sweet communion with God. Can I say to you, who cares about the finest luxury and the best land when you have God? Who cares? What does it matter? I have the one who made the heavens and the earth. You can have that grass. I have God. This is what happens when our eyes are heavenward on Jesus Christ. That's the hymn that we sing, right? There's a song. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. And when you do, what happens? The things of earth begin to grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. They do. This is Abram. He has otherworldly contentment to go without. And he's content. This is walking by faith what does it say in the New Testament of Abram? What does it say? Hebrews 11 verse 9. You get the commentary on our passage. By faith, Abram made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents. He didn't choose the beachfront. He lived in tents. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. And then what has it summed up? Such people of faith were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. This is otherworldly contentment. This is what he has. You see, on a short trip, who cares about first class? Who cares about business class? Our life is but a vapor. We're passing through. That stuff doesn't matter. The journey is short and the destination is extraordinary. Let me quote one other writer. He said this, It does not matter what accommodation we have on the boat when the voyage is so short. Let me ask you, are you walking by faith? Well, that's just a Christian cliche. Let me say a bit more pointed. Are you walking in contentment? 
Are you content? Are you content, Nathan? Are you content in preaching to myself this week? Are you content? Abraham brings peace to the family dispute. What did Jesus say? Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. What happens to the man of faith? He starts reflecting the God he worships. Peacemaker. Peacemaker. And that line in verse 9, I love it. Is not the whole land before you? That is so beautiful. That is so wonderful. Why? Because who did God promise all the land to? To Abram. And what does he do? He surrenders everything. Everything is before you. Everything that was promised to me, I lay at your feet. You choose. You choose. And to bring peace and to reconcile enemies, he surrenders his rights. Does that remind you of anyone? That's Emmanuel. That's Jesus Christ. That's Philippians 2. Though he was in the form of God, he did not account equality with God something to be grasped, but he laid it aside. All of his privileges, all of his divine privileges, he laid it aside. Why? So that he could become obedient, even obedient to the point of death on a cross. Why? To reconcile enemies, to bring peace, to bring peace. Abraham becomes the prototype of the coming one. He doesn't bring peace between herdsmen, but peace between sinners and their God. Peace between sinners and their God. We've seen walking by faith involves ongoing repentance. Walking by faith involves otherworldly contentment. Now we get the other camera angle. We get to see the other scene. Walking by sight. Third point this morning, walking by sight involves seeing only half the picture. Walking by sight involves seeing only half the picture. Lot is offered first choice, but look at verses 10 to 11. And Lot lifted up his eyes and saw that the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt in the direction of Zor. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself all the Jordan Valley and Lot journeyed east. Thus they separated from each other. Don't miss that detail in verse 11 right at the beginning. And Lot chose for himself all the Jordan Valley. This is no incidental detail, right? This is very big. He is, as we said, Abram's nephew. He is inferior in status. What should he have said? No. You choose first. I will never dishonor you by making this choice. You are my elder. You are my leader. You choose first. Never will I do it. And yet what does he do? He pounces. I mean, he pounces on Abram's generous offer, doesn't he? Now, now, why does he do that? He knew the honor, shame culture there. He knew what was right. Why does he do it? Because when he lifts his eyes, he sees the closest thing to heaven on earth. Literally. Did, did you see what it says? He saw the land was watered like the garden of the Lord. What did he see? He saw a place that was so close to Eden, you could almost not distinguish it. It was well watered like the garden of the Lord. A river, remember Genesis 2, a river flowed through Eden. It was well watered. Everything was lush. And Lot sees the valley of Jordan. It's well watered. It's lush. It's flourishing. It's beautiful. It's a slice of heaven. And think back to the context. Lot has experienced famine. He's experienced hardship. He's experienced difficulties where he didn't know if his stuff would survive. He's lived in Egypt and he's survived to tell the tale. He's traveled. He's wandered. He's been roaming. He's experienced life as a pilgrim who has to pass through this world. But now there's a chance to settle down. Now there's a place where everything that I need is provided for in the one spot. The pilgrimage doesn't have to continue. Before him was prosperity. And he was attracted to the highest standard of living, to the good life. And so on one side, what does he see? He sees hills and barren land. And on the other side, he sees lush, rolling hills of grass, the valley that's beautiful. And the Holy Spirit here, what does he emphasize? He emphasizes Lot's seeing. Did you notice in the text? 
he lifted his eyes and he saw. He saw his water like Eden, watered like Egypt. And the seeing influences his decision. That's how he makes a choice. He chooses by sight. He walks by sight. He makes his decision by sight. But here's the problem when you do that. God shows us what Lot unfortunately doesn't see. What doesn't he see? Did you notice it? In verse 10 and 13, it was well watered. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Verse 13, what else didn't he see? The men of Sodom were wicked and were great sinners against the Lord. It all looks so good. It all looks so promising. But what's the problem? The lush fields, all the green grass, it was only hiding what the land's fate would be. Fire, ash, and rubble. He didn't see that, did he? He did not see that coming. His eyes only saw half the picture. Only half. And he couldn't see what he was walking to. He thinks he's walking into the Jordan Valley. He's walking into Death Valley. He doesn't see that. And as he looks at this, as he gets the, as he gets the offer, he thinks he's won the lottery. He thinks he's won the lottery. But the reader, we know more. Lot doesn't win. Lot loses. And he loses big time. Read Genesis 19. He loses his testimony. He cannot convince his son-in-law that God's going to judge the place. He loses his sons-in-law. He loses his dear wife. She's killed. He loses all of his livestock, all his possessions, everything he accumulated to his name. And at the very end, he doesn't realize how lost his daughters are. How much Sodom had them because what do they do? They get him blind drunk in a cave and they rape him. He loses. He loses. He didn't see. He did not see. Lot sees prosperity, but he doesn't see the outcome. He doesn't of his choice. What else doesn't Lot see? He doesn't see the power of temptation. He doesn't see the power of it. Verse 12, what does it say? He pitched his tents near Sodom. So he's living close, but the reader, we're nervous for him because he's getting very close to danger. But then what happens? You read chapter 14, verse 12, what does it say? It says he was living in Sodom. So he's moved from near Sodom to now living in Sodom. And then what do you get in chapter 19? He has a family and a life in Sodom. He's raised a family there. How did he get there? How did he get to this point? It says he saw and he chose. Genesis has already warned us of walking by sight, hasn't it? Eve, tempted by Satan, tempted with her eyes. And what does it say in, verse, in chapter 3, verse 6? When the woman saw that the fruit was of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and desirable for gaining wisdom. She took and ate from it. She saw, but she only saw half the picture. She didn't see the consequences, the misery and the ruin. And the same here is with Lot. He doesn't see. And this choice that he makes would be the biggest mistake of his life. Can I urge you, you who are here, see so clearly the blinding, power of covetousness and greed what is the wage for walking by sight it is ruin and misery the world holds all these things out for us saying you need this you will be happy if you get this if you have that person if you can accumulate this you will be happy you think you see happiness you think you see fulfillment you think you see satisfaction but i'm telling you we are fallen and we cannot trust our eyes we cannot. We cannot. Listen very carefully. Lot saw what he could gain, but he didn't see what he would lose. He saw the benefits, but he didn't see the dangers. Our eyes cannot be trusted. Proverbs 14, 12, There is a, a way that seems right to a person, but its end is the way of death. Our culture, the world, what do they say of Christians? We are fools. Why? Because we walk by faith. What do they say? Faith is blind. It's silly. It's dumb. Live for what you can see in the here and now. Friends, who are the foolish ones? Who are the ones that don't see? They see this life. 
But they don't see beyond the judgment throne, do they? The books being opened and God going through everything. Men and women standing before Almighty God with heaven opened and hell opened. Who doesn't see? Christians. Christians, even we fall into drifting and walking by sight and we start making decisions that are foolish and we rush based on sight on our own understanding and wisdom and we make decisions without asking the question, will this, will this hurt my conscience? Will this affect my soul? Will this be a hindrance and a stumbling block to my children? If we make this move, it seems so good, but are we moving to a place where there's no good church, where there are no believers? Common life choices. Well, if we spend this amount of money, will it prevent us from now being generous? If I take on this, will this prevent me of service of God's people? We need to ask these questions. And I walk by sight. Leads to our last point this morning as time is getting away. We come back to the man of faith. We saw the man of sight. Walking by faith involves relishing occasional foretastes. Let me say that again. It involves relishing occasional foretastes. Now, as we move on, we can't miss how Abram would be feeling at this point, right? He would be, he would be hurt of what his nephew has done. And there would be sorrow that he has to part ways with his family, grieved at a selfish choice. But on top of that, the promises of God seem to be failing. I mean, you promised me such wonderful things, but the land can't hold us, and now my family can't even stay together. Is he thinking back, did I make the right choice? Did I just give up the lottery ticket? God doesn't give him a chance to think like that. He doesn't. God immediately steps in. There's no time for regret. Look at verse 14 to 16. Verse 14 to 16. Then the Lord said to Abram, After Lot separated from him, lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward, for all the land that you see I will give to you and to your offspring Forever, I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth, so that if one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring also can be counted. What did it say in verse 10? Lot lifted up his eyes and saw. What does it say here in, in, in verse 14? God says to Abram, lift up your eyes and see. Lift up your eyes and see. God gives immediate comfort. God gives assurance. Precious medicine to Abram here. And when does God give this word of encouragement? After Lot had left, when he needed it most. This is what God's word does. When you open it and you come prayerfully, humbly to his word, it's a big book, but he gives you the word that you need. Who cannot testify of it when you come to church and God speaks through his word and you say, that was for me. It doesn't matter if there's a hundred other people here. It was for me. And God sends the word to Abram, as soon as it says, after Lot left, at the perfect timing, and he gives him two great promises, I'm giving you and your offspring all the land. Don't worry about what Lot's chosen. This is all yours. It's all yours and your descendants. And then God promises this fatherless man, a child, an offspring. Your offspring will be as numerous as the dust of the earth. Now it may shock us, just for Abram to become a father, he has to wait some 25 years. That's a long wait from the promise, isn't it? But God comes through and even the land, his descendants will inherit it. And Abram receives the true promised land, the heavenly Canaan. But we look at this and we think, oh man, poor Abram. He had to wait so long and he didn't even see all the promises fulfilled in his life. Thank God that we live on this side of the cross and that we don't have to wait like that. Friends, we're in exactly the same boat. We're in the same shoes. We are waiting. The Bible says we are redeemed. Christ has purchased us. He has forgiven all of our sins. We belong to him and our debt's been cleared. But what also does the Bible say? Romans 8, we eagerly await the redemption of our bodies. 
We are still in this frail shell. We still struggle with sin. We still battle. We are waiting. The Bible says we have eternal life even now. This is eternal life that you know God and Jesus Christ and we said we have eternal life and yet what are we still waiting? We're waiting to walk and enter into our inheritance, aren't we? It's kept in heaven for us. We are waiting. We're waiting for these promises to be fulfilled. But this is the beautiful part of the passage. Our waiting, this patient, long endurance, all of this, it's not without foretastes. It's not without foretastes. Look at verse 17. God said to Abram, Arise, walk through the length and the breadth of the land, for I will give it to you. What does God say? You have to wait for the promise. But here's what I want you to do, Abram. I want you to stand up, everything that you just looked at. Now I want you to go and I want you to walk through the land. I want you to see all of it. I want you to feel the grass between your toes. And God gives him a tour of the whole land. This is for you and for all of your people. Just, just have, a, have a feel of it at the moment. Just reach out and just, just touch it, even if it's only momentary. Why is God doing this? Because pilgrims, we live by faith. We wait and we wait and we wait with patient hope. But God graciously gives us little foretastes along the way of the inheritance and doesn't God do this for the church? Doesn't he do this for Christians? We're waiting for great promises. What does it say in Matthew 8, 11? Many will come from east and west and they'll recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then you read Revelation 19, all of the people of God at the marriage supper of the Lamb. We're waiting for that. We're waiting for that feast where we're all gathered together, the great diversity. But what does he give us now? He says, I'm going to give you a little entree. And two times a month we gather together for the Lord's Supper. Not the wedding supper, the Lord's Supper. And that table, who's it made up of? Brothers and sisters of diverse backgrounds. And we come together to celebrate our Lord. When you read Revelation 13 and that, there's this great scene of this innumerable number worshipping around the throne of God. We wait for that day. But what do we get to do every Sunday? We get to gather together and we sing, praise be to the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. We get these little foretastes, these little slices of heaven. This is what he gives to us. Look at Abram's response, verse 18. So Abram moved his tent and came and settled by the oaks of Mamre, which are at Hebron, and there he built an altar to the Lord. And so the narrative ends where it begins. He begins with building an altar to worship God, and it ends with him building an altar to worship his God. And notice where he builds this altar. He builds it in a pagan land. He builds an altar in a land that has many gods. And he builds an altar. This is the true God. He's unashamed to do that, to confess that. And I hope you feel that every Sunday when we gather. Every Sunday, the world mocks Jesus Christ. But what do we do? We come and we say, I love him who was crucified for me. I love him who was buried for me. I love him, he rose for me, and I believe in him, and I'm unashamed of it, and our doors are open for the world. We preach Jesus Christ, and we love to worship him. But again, not just corporately, in privately, our one-to-one -one devotion with him, love to worship God. I love to wake up and worship him. I love to praise him through the day. And with our families together, our home, we love to have family worship. We love to praise his name together. We love to read the word and talk about God. We're unashamed of him. Friends, this is walking by faith. Do you see, it's so much bigger than just this Christian phrase, walk by faith. It's rich. It's ongoing repentance. It's otherworldly contentment. It's not living by sight. And it's relishing, relishing the occasional foretaste that he gives us here. May this be us. May we be marked by walking by faith until we reach the glorious inheritance. Let's pray.
Father, we thank you again for a time around your word. Lord, the gospel is from Genesis to Revelation. You have been saving sinners the same way, by grace through faith. And Lord, we are on the same pilgrimage of faith till we reach the better and heavenly city. We thank you that you've shown us this in your word and we pray that your spirit would be applying it as is needed in each of our lives. Lord, may we hear your word today. If we hear your voice, may we not harden our hearts. We thank you that today is a day of salvation for unbelievers, but we thank you that this is also the day for Christians to renew their faith, to come back to our Bethel, which is Calvary, and to behold the Lord Jesus Christ and our commitment to him and to him alone. Lord, we thank you. For this, we pray you would bless us as we go from here to walk this narrow way patiently as we wait for you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.